For those of you online, I'm sure you already heard our pianist is back, so it's good to have Nancy back with us. I do have a couple announcements that I want to make mention of, and uh, for those of you online, we didn't actually show them this morning, but they're on Facebook. Uh, I think I already put them on there, so the latest announcements are on there. Uh, first of all, a reminder that Andy Hansen from CIY, that's Christ in Youth, by the way, one of the missions that we support, is going to be here August 29th. He'll be bringing the message and an update from Christ in Youth at that time. Uh, also, uh, I've noted or made a notice uh, both online on Facebook and uh, on the announcements that we had this morning about Wednesday evening Bible study, which will be starting September 15th. That's a month from today, 7 o'clock at night. I've titled it Created for Worship. And that's a little bit of a play on words because we're going to be doing something with songs, but you don't have to be able to sing to be there. <laughs> It's going to be a Bible study because there's really these songs, a lot of the songs that we use, a lot of the hymns as well as the choruses that we use were created for worship, but you and I were created for worship as well. And so we're going to do a Bible study uh, on the songs, some of the songs, and also uh, just on us and worship, the idea of worship. So created for worship. We're all created for worship. Thanks for being here this morning. It's good to see you and glad to have you folks online as well. Great is the Lord. Let's sing it together. Oh, that sounds good. <laughs> Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves his love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves he is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. prepare for communion this morning. I want to remind you to have your emblems ready so that you might partake uh, during the communion meditation time. I'm forever grateful. You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself with frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me. I'm forever grateful to you. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. You did not wait for me to draw near to you, but you clothed yourself with frail humanity. You did not wait for me to cry out to you, but you let me hear your voice calling me, and I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful for the cross. I'm forever grateful to you that you came to seek and save the lost. Amen. I'm grateful, aren't you? Amen. You know, when Paul was writing to the Corinthians about the significance of the Lord's Supper, he recalls Jesus' words from Mark 14, to 25. But I'm going to read from 
Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul goes on in that discourse and tells a lot about the Lord's Supper and what its significance is to the one who is partaking. But notice here that Jesus did not say this represents my body. He didn't say this is a symbol of my blood. We know that there are those that believe in transubstantiation. The bread actually turn, and bread and wine actually turns into the actual body and blood of Jesus. It's obvious that this cannot be supported from scientific perspective, at least. An honest scientific analysis would demonstrate that there's still the bread and the fruit of the vine. However, Paul's dissertation here in 1 Corinthians 11 makes it just as apparent that we are somehow getting more, much more, in a spiritual sense than just bread and grape juice when we partake of communion. And Jesus clearly says, this is my body, doesn't he? When speaking about the bread, and this is my blood when speaking about the fruit of the vine. There are other similar kinds of examples in the scriptures. In John 15, 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, doesn't he? I'm the true vine. But he obviously doesn't mean he's a green stalk with branches protruding from him. However, he does refer to us as branches that must stay attached to him in order to bear fruit. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing in John 15, 5. So if we honestly understand the truth of these words, then Jesus really is the place where we get our nourishment and our strength for life. He does not represent a vine, nor is he symbolic of a vine. He is the true vine from where our life flows. And in John 10, 7, Jesus told us, I am the gate. He says, I am the gate. The Greek word here literally means portal or entrance. In this verse, it's clear that Jesus is not a wooden or a metal object through which we pass in order to go from one place to another. However, he is the entrance to the presence of God. He says, I am the gate. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says in John 14, 6. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in that sense, Jesus really is the gate or the door. He's not just a symbol or a representation of the door. He is, in reality, the entrance way to God. The Greek word used there for am and for is in John 10, 7 and in John 15, 1, is the same word used in Mark 14 where he says, this is my body. Uh, I did this for Marion. It's a being verb, the first person singular present indicative. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? <laughs> I had no clue, but that's what the <laughs> commentator told me. <laughs> Which, depending on the sentence structure and translating it into English, will end up either as is, am, or are. Okay, And it means exactly what it says. So just as Jesus truly is the vine from which we gain our strength for all of life, and just as he is the passageway to God, so also when we receive the bread and the fruit of the vine, we are receiving something of the person of Jesus himself, not merely a representation, but somehow the real thing. Coke's not the real thing. Jesus is <laughs> the real thing. It's more than bread and grape juice. It's more than just symbolism. There's a real spiritual transaction taking place with the Lord himself when we partake of the Lord's Supper. But why is this truth significant? It's significant because of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? It's not just symbolism, but it's an actual participation, a communion with Christ himself. According to Mark 14, 22 to 25, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. Let's take the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. 
Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we'll never fully understand the spiritual transformation that takes place during communion. But we are so thankful for the weekly reminder of your great sacrifice for our great sin. This morning, Father, may this act of remembrance strengthen us for the week ahead until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, as we move on to our Sunday school, or not Sunday school, our uh, the junior worship time. Junior worshipers, if there's any here, you're welcome to be dismissed for junior worship at this time while we sing this song. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. I may need some help up here because I can't seem to turn this on. This is on? Okay, all right, thank you. Now this morning, I'm going to look back to the Old Testament, to a passage found in the last book of the Old Testament the book of Malachi. It's a very short book written by the prophet Malachi, the message of God through him, but it has so much in it that's amazing and wonderful, 
And I want to point out one of them this morning. At the time of the writing of Malachi, now this is just about 400 years before Jesus is, comes to earth. At the time of the writing of Malachi, the nation of Israel had once again strayed far from God. Evil abounded. Unbelief prevailed. The majority of people with their own sinful ways, giving little thought to the will and the ways of God. I mean, they laughed at the prophets God sent. They showed utter contempt for God and for his law. Now, does that sound a lot like today? With that in mind, let's listen as God speaks to them through the prophet Malachi. Malachi, the third chapter, verses 13 through 15, says, you have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. And yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Put it bluntly, the people were saying that God was insignificant and irrelevant. In other words, they thought that God was absolutely powerless to do anything anymore. So as a nation, they were ignoring him. He was completely unimportant to them. And I ask you again, does that sound a lot like today for many people? But do you remember, back in the beginning of their nation, of Israel, as their forefathers were settling into the promised land, Joshua, their leader, had challenged them. And we find his challenge in Joshua, the 24th chapter, verses 14 through 18. Let me read part of that to you. Now fear the, Joshua was speaking to the crowd of people after they had pretty well conquered or occupied the promised land. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Then he goes on to say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people responded, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord, our God himself, who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. We too, that first generation said, we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And that generation of Israelites were faithful to its vow. Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, they said, because he is our God. I mean, they didn't forget him or ignore him. So it's no question that the forefathers, 
the founders of the nation of Israel in the promised land had a deep and abiding faith and trust in God. But by the time of Malachi, it's obvious that the nation of Israel as a whole had turned almost completely away from God. Listen again to what God was saying. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. He said, you have said it's futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements? The evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Now again, I ask, does that sound familiar? Is that the attitude of many in our nation today? They're thinking the same way. But let's go on. For in the next few verses of Malachi, there are some things that are rather, well, rather intriguing. Listen to Malachi, the third chapter, verses 16, 17, and 18. Then those who feared the Lord, that means hold him in awe, those who feared the Lord talked with each other. And the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be my treasure possession, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I act, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve the Lord and those who do not. Wow. I mean, that's a rather powerful passage, and it can say it contains a lot that I think we should notice. First of all, it tells us that in the midst of an unfaithful nation, God still had a faithful remnant, a small group who remained faithful to him. Even though a majority of the people had turned their backs upon God, God still had people who honored and worshipped him and sought to do his will. There were not many of them in comparison to the nation as a whole, but they committed themselves to remain faithful to God no matter what anyone else said or did. And while surrounded by the spiritual darkness of their day, they drew closer together to talk with each other, to support and encourage one another. So point number one was that there was a faithful remnant. Number two, it says that God heard them. Well, of course he did. Doesn't the Bible teach us that he hears our prayers? We can pray and know that he has promised to hear our prayers. So, of course, he heard them. But wait a minute. Did you notice? It doesn't say that they were praying. Verse 16 says that those who feared the Lord talked with each other. The Lord listened and heard. Even though they were only a small group in the whole nation, God was paying attention to them. They talked about him, worshipped him, discussed the, his wonderful ways. And as they did, 
it says God was listening to them. He was listening to their conversations. He eavesdropped. He tuned into their frequency. They weren't praying. They were just talking together. Kings were making edicts, but God was listening to his people. Generals were giving orders, but God was listening to a handful of folks talking about him. Judges were speaking in court, but God was listening to his remnant. Politicians were making speeches, but God's ears were tuned to his faithful followers. And I believe that God is doing the same today. Now thirdly, Malachi tells us that God not only listened, but that he also had it all written down in a, quote, scroll of remembrance. Now, did you get that? God was having what was said and who said it written down so that it would be remembered forever. Now, think of that. God really does see and hear what we're doing and we're saying. And not just when we're in church and are praying to him. And it says he's keeping a record of it too. Now fourthly, notice what God says in verse 17. They will be my treasured possession, says the Lord Almighty. In the day when I act, I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. Now, in that verse, the Hebrew word that's tra translated treasured possession is, now here's the Hebrew word, sagula. And it's often translated as jewels or treasure. So God is saying that these faithful people are his jewels, his very own treasure. Now think about that. He goes on to say that in the day when he acts, he's going to remember them and protect them. And God makes his meaning very clear by saying, and you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Now, I think, uh-oh, in the light of that verse, I want to be sure that I'm a part of God's sagula, his treasure. And I hope you do too. But even though we call ourselves Christians, how can we make sure that we're a part of God's faithful remnant today. Now maybe we can find out by looking once again at what this scripture tells us about them and what they were doing. First of all, it tells us they feared the Lord. Now, I need to point out that we in our English language can't get the breadth of what the Hebrew language says. We think of fear as shaking in our boots, as being afraid of being scared. And yes, we ought to be that in some ways before God. But the word in the Hebrew actually means 
to hold him in awe. In other words, if he's our friend, wonderful. If he's our enemy, we need to be afraid. But the word means to hold, and they held God in awe. And because of that, they remained true to him. It was a time when it wasn't easy to stay faithful to God. Even though, I mean, corruption was everywhere. Hypocrisy abounded. Evil ruled the day. And I'm afraid we could very easily say the same thing today. You see, it's never been easy to follow God. But God has always had a remnant. The remnant said, even though everybody else curses God, we will praise his name. They stood for righteousness in a wicked nation. They endured the ridicule of family, friends, and God looked down upon this small group in Malachi's day, this small group of faithful ones, and said, they will be my treasured possession. Now, back in 1947, a professor in the University of Chicago was scheduled to teach an advanced course in astrophysics. At the time he was living, at that time, he was living in Wisconsin doing research. He planned to commute to Chicago twice a week for the class, even though it would be held during the harsh winter months. However, registration for that course fell far below expectations. Only two students signed up for the course. Now, other faculty members expected the professor to cancel the course. I mean, lest he waste his time for just two students. But no, for the sake of those two students, he taught the course, commuting each time a hundred miles round trip through backcountry roads in the dead of winter. All right, it happened. But 10 years later, in 1957, those two students won the Nobel Prize for Physics. And in 1983, so did the professor. They were only, uh, what, a handful, three. But what a handful. I'm a, I, I love his, studying history. I know that for a lot of people, that's just die, uh, dry, uh, dusty information. But I had some teachers of history that made it really come alive. And so I love reading about history. And here's one uh, interesting fact about Frederick the Great of Prussia, who ruled in the mid 1700s. He was widely known as an agnostic. In other words, he didn't believe in God. He doubted that there was a God. But by contrast, his great general, general of the armies of Prussia, von Zeelen, was a devout Christian. Well, one day during a festive gathering in the king's palace, the king began making crude jokes about Jesus Christ until everyone was roaring with laughter. Everyone but von Zeelen, that is. Finally, 
Von Zeeland stood up and addressed the king. And here's what history says he said. Sire, you know I have not feared death. I have fought and won 38 battles for you. I am an old man now, and I shall soon have to go into the presence of one greater than you, the mighty God who saved me from my sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you are blaspheming. I salute you, sire, as an old man who loves his Savior standing on the edge of eternity. The history book says that the banquet hall suddenly went silent. And then with trembling voice, King Frederick replied, General von Zeeland, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. And with that, the party quietly ended. Wow, it's still true. God's Zagula remains faithful in every situation. And not only was this remnant faithful back in Malachi's day, but when they got together, evidently they didn't spend their time gossiping, criticizing, or talking about the weather or sports or current events. They could, ha they could have, but they didn't. They talked about the Lord. They testified about God's blessings and presence. They spoke of answers to prayer. They talked about him. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed how someone in love seems to be able to talk about the person or thing that he or she loves? Well, I, we can talk about young men or young women, but the fellow who loves golf gravitates to those who share his passion for golf and talks about it frequently. The same could be said about politics or football, or any number of subjects of other loves that we have. But here it says that God's special treasure, his segula, are those who love to get together to share with each other about the things of God. Now, how much does your Christianity mean to you. Is it real? Has it made a difference in your life, in the way you talk and how you live? Now, have you heard about, I, I hesitate even to mention this, but have you heard about the bridegroom who purchased only one ticket for a honeymoon trip to Niagara? Falls. He hands it to his bride and says, have a wonderful time. But aren't you going to go, she asks. Oh, no, I've already been there. So you go, and I'll see you when you get back. Now, that story is so ridiculous that I'm not going to go any further with it at all. When people have expressed their love and committed their lives to each other in marriage, they want to be together, to share all that they are with each other. And 65 years ago, yesterday, Ethel and I stood before a congregation 
and both said, I do, and I promise, and I will. <laughs> and in the same way, those who commit their lives to Christ, who become a part of his bride, the church, want to be together and share all they are with each other. And finally, look at the latter part of verse 16. There it says that God caused a scroll of remembrance to be written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Not only were these faithful people in awe of God and eager to share their faith in him with each other, but they also honored him by their words and by their lives. They remembered the mighty acts of God they believed what the prophets had said and written about him. And Psalm 1-1 says, Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit at the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law, he meditates day and night. In a speech in Dallas, Texas, Corey Ten Boom, you know the name, the author of The Hiding Place, said that many times people would approach her after she's told about her time in the Nazi concentration camps, the death of her sister there, the death of her parents there. After she would speak about that, they would come to her and say, Corey, what a great faith you have. And she smiled as she said how she would reply. No, it's what a great God I have. And whether it was in the nation of Israel then or in the United States of America today, it is still true. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. I believe that with all my heart. And I would hope and pray that you would come. If, you don't, if not yet, if you are not yet a follower of Jesus, if you're not one who committed your life to him, if you're not one yet who said, I want to follow him, accept him as my Lord, my Savior, follow his example, his command in baptism, I would pray that you would make that decision. Maybe even make it today. Last night we had more than 60 people here as one was baptized from Cooks and Hills. Oh, what a praise and what a joy it is to see a new life, a new relationship with God that can be yours if you have not yet accepted him. Or if you're already a Christian, you've done this. And you need a place to worship, to serve, to be a part of a family. We invite you to make this congregation your place of service. If you have a decision to make, would you make it as we stand and as we sing together? <laughs>
Please be seated for a time of prayer. This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.